So this is going to pick off, pick up where I left off before um, about uh, the resource dashboard. Last time I talked about what it is and why we built it, um, and now this time around I'm going to talk about how I went about building it. Um, so we, we we had an opportunity in building these admin UIs to do something that wasn't kind of business critical so uh, and was relatively self-contained. So I want to uh, consider some of the problems that we have in developing the website and think about what I've read and um, experienced from the way other people do stuff and see if I can try out some of those other patterns and see if it's better. I think it is better. Um, <coughs> so what what are the problems that I think that we have and I think lots of other people have as well with their UI development now, especially more than ever now with the um, ubiquity of this kind of single page app approach where everything's in the client um, spag <coughs> spaghetti, but not, not the kind of spaghetti that we've always had. Um, I think we've just got a different kind of spaghetti now. We used to have where is the code spaghetti and now we've got what the hell is going on spaghetti. <laughs> um, so it's like data spaghetti. And this is caused by, in part, this concept of the two-way data flow which is very, very prevalent in all these frameworks that are there to help you. Um, Angular specifically sells itself on this and it's seductive. You look at it and you go, oh, just type that in and it's just synchronized. Is this the binding? Yeah, so you type into a text box and it's immediately synchronized to your model and vice versa and it's brilliant and it's a disaster. Um, so you've got this totally out of control mutation of everything. You, you've, you've got in your head this kind of nice model for your screen and, and it all maps up nicely but then um, somewhat dependent on the implementation you get this problem with the you can mutate any any part of your model from anywhere uh, and you have no idea what's going on. This is particularly acute in Angular where you have this concept of scope and the scope can be inherited and really if you're modifying property on scope the bottom line is you you basically have no idea what will happen um, and you can and all of the examples are small and you think yes it's great and it is until it gets big until there are lots of views uh, and then it and lots of state and then you get into trouble you can get into trouble you can control it but it's a lot of mental effort to keep all of this in your head um, also one of the tricks that Angular does for you is the change tracking obviously to do this binding you've got to know when something has changed um, and in an environment where anything can change and anything can change it change tracking becomes an expensive and complicated thing, uh, both in terms of computation and also memory, because everything's got to be copied all over the place, and uh, you know, deep copying, deep comparisons, it's all slow and expensive. Uh, and that can lead to performance problems, that's one of the common criticisms of Angular. If you watch too much stuff, then everything grinds to a halt. Again, you can deal with it if you know about it. Um, but it's not the headline on why you should use Angular and you don't often find out about it until it's too late. So, this is, a, this is like an internet meme, you might have seen this. This is Rich Hickey, he's the inventor of Clojure and um, one of the things people common, commonly attribute to him is this phrase, state you're doing it wrong. I don't know if he ever said it, but that's the conclusion of all those problems that I think um, I've come to uh, having spent a fair bit of time working with Angular um, and, and other approaches over the years. Because it's not just Angular that's allowing you to hold this state and, and mutate it willy-nilly. <coughs> Angular is just Angular is just providing an abstraction anyway on top of the DOM and the DOM itself is a big blob of state that anything can modify. So you, I don't want to make this about Angular, it's about not having control over the data flow in the, in the UI. So 
kind of back up a bit and think a little bit about functional programming, which is the sort of new bandwagon. Although I don't think it is a bandwagon, really. Um, so there are many holy wars fought on the internet about the definition of functional programming, but I'll just say a few things that I think are true. Uh, they tend to be, functional programs tend to be compositions of pure functions, and pure functions be meaning stateless functions. Uh, so they just operate on their input parameters. Uh, if you give them the same input parameters, they will always give you the same output parameters. That, uh, they'll always give you the same result. So there are no side effects. Um, the implication of this is that pure functions are really easy to test because they have no dependencies other than their input parameters. There's no funny state. No one's going to pull the rug out from under you by updating some state by the back door. If you put what you put in, that's what you get. They're also easy to parallelize for the same reason. They can only operate on what you give them. They can't interact with each other, so you can run them at the same time. You should be able to reorder them as well. Um, this makes them also easy to refactor in principle. Um, so then a side effect of this is that they should be more predictable than OO programs because um, it's, a, so yeah, it's a side effect of not having side effects is that the program runs predictably uh, and in some cases fast. And an important part of this is that you, you need to favor immutable data so that things don't get pulled out from underneath you. So if you want to modify some state, you don't modify it, you just return a copy with whatever you wanted to change, changed. Uh, this turns out to be important, but I've just parked that there for the, for the time being. So the, the, lots of people have been talking about this sort of stuff for, for decades, uh, uh, but you don't often see it applied to the front-end development. Um, but given that the problem that I think we have is around handling of state, this looks like a promising thing to try to do. So, to correlate those points back to the, the UI problem, you, you consider a, a website or an individual web component as a as just a composition of UI components, the same way that you would compose functions. And you consider a UI component to be a, a pure function that simply accepts application state and then spits out some sort of representation of what it looks like in that state. And this simplifies a lot of things. If you put the same state in, you get the same UI out. And if you put different state in, you get a new UI. And that's all there is to it. Um, so, this is this is um, quite different to the way that Angular works, but it's it isn't that uncommon. Um, does anyone recognise this logo? Yeah. This is so. <laughs> so yeah, this is this pattern is is very much. Um, React pattern. So React is a library from Facebook that is just in the business of rendering views. And uh, so you describe your views completely in JavaScript or JSX, which is this, this DSL they invented. Um, and it gives us this strict one-way data flow that I think we want. Um, and basically, all of the components in a React application are just pure functions. You pump in some properties and state and then it renders the UI. And then all you all you can do is modify the state and then React takes care of the rest. You don't have to worry about timing or anything. You can consider all of your components a, a snapshot point in time. Um, and then the other important point is that the React functions don't return HTML, they return uh, a representation of the DOM of that component in its current state. And then behind the scenes, React will basically compare that to the previous virtual representation of this component and tell you if they're different. And if they are different, it's 
it's in a much better position to work out quickly and efficiently what bits of the real DOM need to be modified. So even if you've got a very complicated component and you've changed the state of it and it does need to be re-rendered, it doesn't necessarily result in very many um, real-life DOM updates, and that's the bit that's slow. And so it tends to be um, a very fast way to do things because you've got one-way flow in a virtual DOM, and then if you combine that with immutable data as well, the actual change tracking itself is very quick. So there are two, two things going on. One is that React is saying, has the state changed at all? And if you've got immutable data, React can just say, are these two objects the same? Literally, the same object. If they are, it hasn't changed, and if they're not, it has changed. They don't need to drill into it at all, because the things are immutable, um, and they, they cannot have changed while still being the same object. So if you can add that extra step of immutable data, you can improve upon the already fast um, general mechanism of React. Uh, I don't. Th I don't think Facebook really invented this, though. I think there's prior stuff, um, but this is this is the most popular um, manifestation of this sort of pattern, and it's quite commonly used. And there's quite a lot of other frameworks that build on top of React because React is just a library. It doesn't tell you anything about how to manage your state. It just says, given this state, this is how we render the views efficiently. So you can use React with Angular. Maybe we should, but um, we haven't yet. Uh, so, so I got this far. I want to use this approach. There is this thing React. Uh, so, obviously, React is written just in pure JavaScript. Um, so then I wanted to. Why? Why did I go for Closure? Um, so does anyone, everyone knows a bit about Clojure, probably a little bit. It's like a, it's a, it's a Lisp, which is like a, a list-based language, um, so, which is a very old concept. The scheme was created when? Who knows when? I don't know. Eight decades ago, um, and there are lots of different implementations of this. Clojure is one. It it's primarily targets the JVM, but it's it can also com com compile to um, CLR as well, although I haven't tried that. And the and, and then there's Clojure Script, which will compile to JavaScript. So this second point, we all transpile anyway. This is my first puke because I don't like this word. But so our, our client-side build process involves taking some language that wouldn't actually work in the browser and changing it into one that does. We go from uh, ES6 JavaScript to ES5 JavaScript. Almost everyone is doing that, it seems. So it begs the question, well, why are you using JavaScript at all? It's a terrible, terrible programming language. Um, uh, so in, in, our, in our most recent admin stuff, we're using TypeScript, which is a less terrible um, experience but it isn't so much a functional programming language and it doesn't it doesn't get you some of the things that closure gets you so it's a really well designed um, language it's been completely created by one bloke rich hickey he has this concept called hammock driven development where he basically goes off and shuts his computer for three years and the, the end result is something that really by and large makes a lot of sense it's a, it's a good approach it's kind of anti-agile <laughs> um, there, there, I'll just run through some things about closure which aren't necessarily relevant here like you, you can do uh, meta programming really well with it um, and this is a sort of side effect of the fact that closure code is expressed in in terms of closure data so that's hard to explain. <laughs> you, you can write code that writes code very easily uh, because the code is data. So if you wrote a closure program, you could pass that closure program into a closure list and, and manipulate it using closure and write, spit out more code. Uh, it will might become more clear, might not. Um, 
this is my second puke word. <laughs> uh, isomorphic meaning that you, well, used to mean that you can run it on server and the client, you can run the same code. It's not totally the same. Uh, Clojure has this thing called uh, reader conditionals where, where you have, you can have the same file and you can have little chunks of code that are different for different platforms. There aren't that many, to be honest. Closure Script and Clojure are very, very similar and have um, all the same capabilities, but there are cases where you want to know whether you're on the server or the client. Uh, that would take a bit of planning and that would pay dividends in the end, I think. It would mean you could run your tests. You could run, if you factored your client-side code well, you could run all of your um, UI tests on the server with no browser involved or anything. And that would be a really useful thing. This, okay, this, thinking this is the website backend, not the services. You could easily write the services in Clojure as well. It, I'm not. It, this is all. It's, um, it, I think it is because I think sometimes we are doing similar things. Like you might think of an example like validation, where you where where the rules are the rules. Uh, you you could you could come up with cases probably. It's just it's just a thing everyone seems to be obsessed with, and in, um, it's particularly relevant to, to 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 us on the website side because of things like SEO, and it's one of the failings of Angular that um, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to get search engines to see and understand the rendered page, but if you can do server-side rendering, which is feasible in, um, well, it's feasible in JavaScript, but I don't want to use JavaScript unless I have to, because it's, as mentioned, a terrible language. Not terrible. <laughs> Idiosyncratic. Uh, so Clojure, I've read, it's got a functional slant. It's not like a totally pure functional language. You can do naughty things. Um, it's pragmatic that it's mostly functional. So data is immutable by default, uh, and it, it's very good at handling concurrency over those uh, data structures. Out of the box, it's all done. It's got like its transactional memory stuff, so you, 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 know, you don't have to reinvent all that stuff. If, uh, it has a really nice... Um, uh, REPLs, so you can connect live to both an executing website or an executing server and um, interact with the running code, um, which is really nice. It makes for a really good experience for developing websites because you can just change the code, hit save, and it's and it's done. Or you can, you know, type from the command line and actually interact with the code like that. I hope I'll show you a bit of that later when I, if I've got time. And it's a bit mental, it's a bit crazy closure, and it did depends on what, what, your, what your outlook is. I quite enjoy it because it's um, entertaining. Yannick's a fan. Um, and so, as mentioned in React, all React components are built using JavaScript, so all the HTML is written using JavaScript. You don't write HTML. Same is true um, the way we've done it with the resource dashboard. And I think this is just an absolutely no-brainer sensible thing to do because HTML isn't a string. It's, it's a recursive data structure and it has rules. And the more you can encapsulate those rules in code, the easier it is to write correct HTML and safe HTML. And um, Reagent, which is one of the tools I've been using to wrap uh, React in ClojureScript uses Hiccup, which is a HTML library, which is very nice. So those things, that's why I decided to use Clojure. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll show you a bit of Clojure, but we need to understand the, how Clojure works first. It's very simple, very simple, which is one of its beauties. So, everything starts, everything's based on S expressions, which start with an open bracket. There are a lot of brackets, deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> then the first form inside the S expression is always the function that you're going to call. 
then you come some arguments, one or more arguments. The arguments can be functions themselves. The arguments can be anonymous functions. Uh, that's the syntax for that. And then you close your S expression. That's it. <laughs> There are, there are a few other things, but basically that everything is that. And, it, and you, you can get a bit crazy with the brackets, but that's really tooling. I, I started to think that was a problem, but it isn't really. Well, if you've got the right editor, um, it's fine. The, the editor you have is probably not the right editor. <laughs> and so this refers back to what I was talking about before. You notice that this whole function is a list. So a list enclosure is a thing in, in, enclosed in normal brackets, right? So this is both data and code. That doesn't tend to be significant very often. But I think it's very significant for people who write interpreters and compilers and macros and stuff like that. Um, so that's why I wanted to use closure. Closure on its own closure script on its own isn't the friendliest of things and doesn't doesn't help us in any way to implement this reacty style pattern of one way data flow and you know the other stuff so the next thing to layer on top is a thing called reagent which is a uh, a closure script wrapper around react so everything else is basically the same as React, although it's a little bit simplified. Um, I'm going to skip that component because it's silly. So, this is an example of a reagent component. Two re two reagent components calling another, calling each other. So that that D F E N that's a, a closure keyword that means define a function. Okay. So, reagent components are just functions. Uh, and then inside that top one, the second line there, you can see that the square brackets, they are uh, a vector, which is a closure data structure. And then inside, you can see these these are an HTML tag. So you've got a P tag that says hello, and then the name that we passed into this component. And it's that will render as uh, an HTML P tag. And it's as simple as that, right? Then slightly more complicated example here this is an example of how reagent adds state handling to your site so this counting component here it's got a div inside it you can see and then nested inside the div we've got an input which is a button then at the top there you've got this clip count using a thing called an atom uh, atom is one of closures primitives for handling uh, mutation and the state that has to change okay uh, and that's where the transactional memory comes along. People, have, you know, if you, you can update Atom simultaneously, and everything will be okay. Um, what Reagent does is create its own version of this Atom, uh, which adds a little layer of magic. And basically, what it does is says any any Reagent component <coughs> that uses or modifies this Atom will be automatically re-rendered when that atom is uh, mutated in any way. <coughs> so this line at the bottom here on click, I'm swapping click count and passing in ink. So that means that I'm taking the atom click count, which contains an, a number, and I'm running ink on it, which is increment. Is it <coughs> using a watch or so on the atom? Yes, yeah, it is. So re that's the bit that Reagent is adding. Reagent's keeping track of all of the components that reference that atom, and that therefore need to um, need to be re-rendered when it changes. So, so what atoms be getting? Double then? Or yeah. Are they okay? Yeah, this is yeah. the one. This is the like I said, it's not a pure functional language. There are mechanisms here for swapping out state. Um, so that was a, an example. That, this is an example of global state, and that can very quickly get out of hand. That doesn't really offer us much of an improvement on what we've already got. 
So the next thing that Reagent can allow you to do is um, create local atoms. So in this shared state component, you, you can see that it, it does, um, this is the function that actually creates the component. Then we create our local state. This is like a, like a variable declaration enclosure. So we're creating a local atom with this value in it. Then your nested anonymous function, that's the actual render function. That's the only thing that gets run when the component is re-rendered. Not this, just that. So this stays the same. And so then we're nesting inside that this uh, input text. And when that input text changes, we reset the value. Because that value has come from this atom, this render function will automatically get rerun. Uh, so it works in exactly the same way that it only really re-renders itself when it needs to. But the advantage is that you, you can consider that state local to that component. And that can help you split things out and um, stay on top of the uh, state handling a bit better. So that's good. That's a good improvement, I think. And uh, it's relatively simple. But I'm still finding that it gets out of hand. Um, so, there is another layer. <laughs> the layer on top is called reframe. Uh, you, you could, um, th this is quite similar to the layers that are put on top of React in the JavaScript world. There's the flux, which is this sort of pattern on top of React, whereby um, you have data stores and your components can fire off messages that are picked up by handlers and they modify the data store and that then spins back around in a circle, re-renders your components. Um, reframe is a similar thing. Uh, actually, what it does, it imposes a, a very opinionated way of dealing with your state on the application. So you, you have one database, basically, or data store, or whatever you want to call it, just a blob of state that your whole app uses. And then you partition this into different chunks and then you create subscriptions onto individual bits of that data that you're interested in and these uh, these are like signals basically you can subscribe to them and you will receive updates only when they change and you can compose these signals as well so if you, you can create very very targeted um, subscriptions on just individual bits or combinations of bits of your data um, so this is what uh, a, a subscription would look like in Reagent. Basically, it's a function that is receives the database, which is all of your data, and returns this thing called a reaction on whatever slice of that data you're interested in. So it's dead simple to define your subscriptions. What's a database? It is just a blob of data. Right. It can be whatever so you want. In it's in, yeah, in memory, it's, it's in client. No. This is a more complicated one. No, this is like this is a pager control. Okay, so it's not that complicated. It's just a lot. Of, it's real code, so there's probably noise in there that I could have cut out. So that um, that subscription I just showed is is a slice of data called paging. It's basically stuff that a pager needs to know, like the current page index and the page size and all that sort of stuff. So the, I define my component, then I, then I have my subscription to where I get hold of that data. And it's, it comes through like an atom, basically. It's a thing that's like dereferenced. So, and then internally here, I'm pulling out various bits from inside that chunk of data, index size, total, number of pages, and start and end, that sort of stuff, right? And then um, some HTML, and then the clickers for <coughs> changing page. And what happens when, when I change page, what I'm basically saying is that I'm, I will be modifying the state of this slice of data. So it's a state changing operation. So I call this dispatch function here and send off 
what's happened. I changed page and I've incremented it. And then that's all the component itself needs to do. It just subscribes the data, fires off messages. It doesn't have to worry about re-rendering itself or anything like that. And then where does that dispatch go? That goes the, the, the last piece in the puzzle is the, is the handlers. So I have this a register, a handler called change page that receives the database and the operation and any sort of payload I want to, to pass with the operation. <coughs> and all it, the responsibility of this handler is to basically return the new database. So whatever it needs to do to change the state, all it has to do is, in this case, it goes off and does a search for the new page of data, and then it, this is the database, it's all the state system. So it's basically taking the new paging object and replacing <coughs> that inside the database and then returning it. At that point, the reframe library takes over and says, now the state is in a different bit, all these all these little signals fire off for anything that happens to be listening to the particular bit of the database that has changed and then all of those components will magically re-render themselves based on what has changed. Does it always work on the whole, the whole, always more than the whole stage? The whole yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. And it's smart enough to deal with the cascade of events. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've never really, I mean, I've had, obviously have problems with it where it's not doing what I expect it to do, but basically it's pretty easy to work with um, because it's, although it's very new and novel, it's very, very simple. You, you just have to, you don't have to think about a lot of the things that you're used to having to think about. Or it behaves in a way you expect. Sorry? It behaves in a way you expect. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid using that awful phrase that it makes your program easy to reason about. <laughs> but it does. Uh, this is another Rich Hickey quote. Not everything is awesome. <laughs> I, um, I'll slightly revise this now. But testing I didn't really do. But it's, it's there, there's loads of test frameworks for closure, and it's quite straightforward. But the browser, the closure script testing specifically, was a bit more faffy than I was expecting. Um, but that's really just because I hadn't set it up properly. Um, like I said before, if you use reader conditionals to uh, to split your code into the stuff that needs um, <coughs> needs to be browser aware and doesn't, then testing can be achieved quite easily, but it's um, it's not something I've really dug into. Um, debugging is definitely something that requires a change of attitude. <laughs> like, people are used to being able to just hit the breakpoint, step through the code, but I'm sure people are, have experience trying to debug a, a massive link expression, and a lot of functional code just ends up being like a massive link expression so there's just one expression um, but I found that it was initially I felt like a fish out of water and I thought well how do I debug this thing and it's got it, I mean, it supports source maps and all that stuff so it is in theoretic it is in theory perfectly possible to debug closure script in the browser's debugger but it wasn't very useful and I found that I ended up using much more um, of a REPL based approach so if something wasn't working how I thought, then I would connect the REPL to the running program and just sort of interrogate the data and try some things. You can even modify the code. Um, can you do rate processing? Well, in closure script, you can you can put breakpoints because you've got a source map, so you can you can put, put breakpoints in. But I was finding that they weren't very accurate, and the stepping through wasn't really working very well because the, 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 the variables you want to look at aren't the real variables. Uh, just, it's easier it's easier just to query it through the REPL, um, which you can do client and server, um, and it's fine. 
So then there are barriers, obviously, in the way the language looks. Everyone seems to find that a bit um, headache-inducing. I don't mind it at all. So if there's any um, mitigation, it's just trust me, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, I So like years ago, if I was doing mucking around with something outside work, I would use .NET. And then a few, a few years after that, I would always use Node. Now I always use Clojure because it's easy. Um, I don't know what will come next. I sort, I sort of do know what's going to come next, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so then, um, this is, I guess, the, the big question, because <laughs> I don't know is the answer. <laughs> I think, I think the, that the architecture is really good and has a, a lot of, shows a lot of promise, and I think we should do something like it. Inexplicably, we're not. <laughs> In our new admin stuff, we're using TypeScript and Angular, and I don't really know how this has happened. Um, but there are lots of, so this exact stack is gonna, is gonna cause problems. Like, not a lot of people know Clojure. Uh, there is a thing, though, there's a thing called the Python paradox, I think, where, you know, if you, if you start using an esoteric programming language, then your pool of applicants suddenly changes to <laughs> to people who motivated themselves to get up and learn the esoteric programming language, and they tend to be the sort of programmers you want. Uh, but it is, it's an issue, of course. There aren't that many closure programmers, but um, I definitely think there are lessons to be learned from it. And what I'm if I w I'm looking at Elm at the moment. Elm is a is a more pure functional programming language. This is a similar approach. Lots of lots of uh, these frameworks kind of hat tip Elm as their inspiration. And so you ask yourself, well, why don't we just use Elm? Because they're obviously doing it right. Um, that that's an because e because this this approach solves a lot of problems, but it and, and it. It half solves the JavaScript problem, but then leaves you with the closure closure problem, <laughs> which is a it's a much better language. It's a language I like a lot, but it is still a dynamic language, and it's a bit of a tough sell to move on the server, particularly from a, a strongly typed language to a dynamic language, and because <coughs> there's going to be people waiting for you to cause dynamic language type problems, and then go, ah, I told you. So. Um, so Elm, I think, solves all of the architectural problems and the language problem. In the, it, it's it's a really interesting thing to look at, and I'm gonna. Is, um, is Elm more just constrained to that UI? Well, you know, exactly. Yeah. That's why you use Elm. It's generally. Yeah. Programming language that you know the server. No, I don't think you, I don't think you can use it on the server yeah. at the moment. I think they've got plans to do the whole server-side rendering thing, mm -hmm. um, and. And he, he, the guy has plans to make it compile to um, whatever, rather than just JavaScript. Yeah. So I think that will come along. But if you're going to use it on the server, then then um, it, it's not that dissimilar to something like F Sharp or or Haskell. Is it similar to ha Haskell? Yeah. So the, the just use the it's not as hardcore as Haskell. It's a bit. <laughs> it, it's a bit more hardcore than F Sharp, but not yeah. quite as hardcore as Haskell. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess like that one of our jobs as programmers is to sort of constantly look for better abstractions, and I think this particular pattern is a better abstraction for developing UIs. Uh, so, should we do this sort of thing? Yes, it absolutely should do this sort of thing because you learn loads of stuff. Um, should we uh, should we do exactly this? Pro probably, probably not. But I change my mind all the time. I should definitely look into it. I'll definitely learn it. Yannick will tell you it's good fun. It's good fun. <laughs> 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 iOS and Android. Android 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 and Android.
native iOS apps if you want. I can't see that happening, but yeah, there's a. I think the 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 goal of Clojure was always to be targeting multiple environments, and more than ever at the moment, JavaScript just seems like a sort of a, a target runtime environment, and the language is not that important. People have been using CoffeeScript for ages, which is horrible, but we've been using ES6 for ages, and we're probably going to move to TypeScript, but it doesn't really matter. Um, or rather, it's a step, it's a leap we've already taken, so, you know. Um, so, I thought I would uh, also, I do have time, so I'll just show a few bits and pieces. So I have this running locally, hopefully. Hopefully. Or do I? Yeah, I do. Okay, so I want to just um, mention a couple of things that I, well, demonstrate a couple of things that I mentioned. So this this thing here is the is the closure script REPL. This is connected to the running website, and I can demonstrate that by doing something like this. And you see that does do the alert. So that's running a REPL on the inside of the browser process. No, it's not. It's running on the server. Yeah. But it's, it's got some magically <laughs> talking to the client. Now, raising alerts is not particularly well, useful. Does. So, it could happen to another client as well. The same for one client. So, if you had another window open. Yeah, but only because I'm running it locally. I think I think so. That's a good question, actually. Let's try it. Can't do the uh, repeat last command, which is really annoying. Control it, up. it doesn't work. Oh, control up, is it? Yeah. There you go. So that one went, and that one went. Yeah. So it does both. That's going to get confusing, so I'm going to turn that off. Um, so I'm connected. That's not terribly useful in its uh, uh, of itself at the moment, but I need to get into uh, where the actual code is to make that useful. Um, let me just get into the code so I can see what I'm doing. So this is the code for the, the resource list, which is what we're looking at, this list of the, the search screen. Uh, so like there's some sort of simple demonstration of some of these things. Um, this bit here, the, the header row, is, is a simple thing to show the render function at work. So it's basically just a a header, an HTML header, and it's got these two buttons to tell whether we're in pre-prod mode or live mode. Um, so that's that header row there, key, pre-prod value, live value, tenant app culture. Um, so like I mentioned before, this is the this is the function here that actually creates the component. And then this is the function that actually renders the component. So what we should see is that this render function doesn't actually run unless it has to. So if I put something, that PRN is just like a lock console log thing. Um, now if I look at the output here, you can see at the bottom, when does this run? So it ran because it refreshed the page. So we'll clear that. 
and we, we we can do normal stuff. Like this whole list is re-rendering and jigging around and stuff, but the actual state for that header row has not changed. So we get no message. It hasn't rendered itself at all. It hasn't had to because nothing has changed that it cares about. So we can see what does it care about? It's subscription there at the top. The only thing it's subscribing to is the list mode, and that is whether it's in pre-prod or live. That's all it cares about. So the only time we should see that render function run is if we actually click this button, basically. And we do, sure enough. So that's good. That's what we expect to happen. Um, so one of the things that we can do then is actually navigate to this particular bit of code from this REPL, which is quite often useful. The syntax is a bit weird to do this, but just bear with me. Uh, what is it? So that's just me loading that namespace <coughs> that I'm interested in. The namespace is the very top line there. NS means namespace. Then I actually have to get into that namespace. These little ticks I'm putting in, don't worry about them. <laughs> so I'm now inside the namespace of this thing, right? So I can, the only way this app can change is by dispatching messages to the, the message handler. So what happens when you change the list mode is it goes off, it's defined in this component here. When I click on one of these buttons, it dispatches an event called set list mode, and that's it. It doesn't care. What will then happen, knock on effect will be this subscription will change, and this component will re-render. So we can provoke that by just doing that from the command line. Uh, so we should have access to that thing. Let's just check what mode it's in at the moment. So it's in live mode at the moment. We could be able to change it to pre-prod. Uh, too many things going on here. So we'd want to So we want to change it to pre-prod. And that should work. It's going to be pre-prod now. And it is. So that's a really useful thing to be able to do quite often. And you can see like any any action, in fact, the only mechanism by which this whole thing can do anything is via dispatching these messages. So you can fully control the whole thing and obtain the whole state of the thing and rebuild the current state of the thing all from the command line perfectly easily. And there, there are like some more wacky implications of that. You could you could time travel very easily. There's one database and there's a controlled stream of events that modify that database. And, and all of the existing states still exist because nothing is mutable. There's nothing's mutated here. It's just swapped. Um, so you could very easily put some generic thing in the, those message handlers to just tuck away every state. And then you could time travel the, the whole application very easily. If you, if you had a, a website that had some sort of error on it, you could easily just dump the state. And that is, that is the application. There is no extra thing that could possibly be going on, um, which is quite cool. Uh, if I wanted to add some new button, say, then I can do that easily enough as well. But it's not like that, I can't. Yeah, it's the pressure, it's the pressure. Let's say I want to add a dev one. So 
I didn't refresh the page or anything. It's just magically there. This is cool. <laughs> um, can you do this side by side? You think I'm, you think I'm, <laughs> you think I'm cheating? <laughs> I don't want everyone to see how dreadfully my yeah, site yeah. works in a responsive way. That's the problem. It doesn't. Uh, we can do this side by side. So there it is. You see, there's nothing up my sleeve. No, no, I just want to see the reaction up by. Okay, okay. Oh, it's actually up to save. Right. I'll save it. So I'll save it now. There we go. Let's go. Or I can put it back again. It doesn't do it while you're typing. <laughs> but we can also do the, the event thing while we type. Um, it doesn't work for me, Adam. You lying bastard. <laughs> uh, just to see that that does actually do it while we watch. What did I say? It was dev. Is that what I said it was? Let's do prod because I know that one works. So that's pretty immediate. Um, so lastly, let's just have a look at what that, those, what those subscriptions and handlers look like for this particular interaction. So the subscription is list mode. Uh, that is in something called API dot. So the subscription, there's nothing to it at all. It's just literally a slice of data in our database with a key of list mode and a value. That's all there is to it. Nothing interesting there. Set list mode is the, is the handler. So all the handler does is receive the database. Uh, ASOC is a closure keyword for just um, sort of looks like it's updating, but it's not updating, it's copying and modifying that particular bit and then returning the new thing. So it's, all, it's just, it receives the database, um, the name of the event, which we don't care about, so we have this placeholder, and the value, which is the new mode. So then we just return the database with list mode set to the new mode, and that's, that's all it is. The rest of it is handled by the libraries. Um, So I'm just going to put this back to how it was because I don't really want that in there. Um, so all, all of the server side code for this is also written in Clojure script. Um, not Clojure script, Clojure. The big advantage, I, I, I wanted to run this on my Linux laptop so I just cloned it on here and ran it and it worked, which is nice. Um, but, and it all looks exactly the same. It's nice having the same language in two places. All, all the arguments that have already been made for that. But uh, I, I did go through a, uh, an experiment of doing the sort of things that we do in our APIs and Clojure once, and it's fine, easily doable. Um, and personally, I do find that a lot of the stuff we do, you, you, you start to regard as a bit weird, all this sort of like having a big faff about dependency injection with Corel the other day and thinking that's just a that's just a, a higher order function, isn't it? That's just a function that takes a function. What are we doing all this for? Um, but that's uh, I don't know. So I think that's about all I had to say on the subject. Are there any questions? Where's the data stored? In it's our database. And what? It's on SQL Server. So, OK, the data bit is somewhat interesting, so let's have a look at it. Uh, uh, it's really just you said you're running it on the Linux box. No, um, it's, it's on our databases. Um, so I'm just using a normal connection string for SQL Server. The, the but where's the SQL Server on your laptop? No. It's pointing at both Erasure and Cream because it's a live and pre prod. I don't get it. If the, if the closure. He's got a network connection on the. Oh, right, right, that's right. Oh, yeah. 
I'm using a library called YesQL. I'm not <coughs> sure how one goes about saying that. Uh, which is um, quite interesting. It doesn't go down the whole ORM route, which I think is a good thing. Uh, sort of takes the view that we already have a really effective DSL for writing database queries. Let's use that, and then it just converts them to closure functions that you can use. Um, where are they, Yannick? They're in resources, aren't they? For some Sorry. weird reason. So basically, we just write the SQL, um, and then it has these comments above each um, query that basically gets mapped to a closure function, and then uh, and then in the source you can. Where is the backend stuff? Some of the roots. So I can let's find. Uh, so we'll do the find thing. So this 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 line here I've got highlighted is the actual main find some of a set of resources function, and it will go off to get page resources, which I'm again failing to find. I don't know how this works anymore. You've got the top there. Okay, but, but here's, here's, here's a query anyway. Um, that, that basically is one of the queries, it's one of the functions that get automatically created and it just correlates directly with one of those SQL queries, that's all it is. And it just takes care of mapping the data to and from closure data structures. It's very minimal. Um, but what's doing the next thing? Uh, I really don't know if this is right. right. I don't think it is. I, I have a, a file of connections, which is my connection string. And then <coughs> I just, th this is kind of a weird example because I need to do production and pre-prod in the same thing, which is slightly unusual. So I just um, define, a, define a connection there, which is using the, the production connection string and I define all my queries from that SQL file. It's quite easy. Uh, I, mean, I, didn't, we, I don't think we really paid too much attention to the back end because we always kind of thought that we would throw this away and API fire. That's still a work in progress. <laughs> work not in progress, yeah. Yeah, work not in progress, but it works fine. Um, it, it, it wasn't much trouble, to be honest. So. What else is of interest? Yeah, I think I think we'll probably leave it at that. Is anybody questions? Stunned silence. How how big a limitation to have is a dynamic memory? Does that really bother you? Do you think? <coughs> it do, it doesn't bother me that much, and I think there are things you can do. You there's like. Um, Schematic is this thing where you can create schemas for your uh, records. There's typed closure where you can. Th there's a project underway for gradual typing in closure. Um, there's um, pre and post conditions in functions where you can sort of validate the shape of your data if you if you care about it. But yeah, Th there is a fair bit of that. Yeah, it is a weakness, no doubt. Um, well, it's a thing. I haven't done. I've written tests. I have written closure tests, and it is pretty easy to do. Um, yeah, there. Are Would you have even have potentially more tests? Yeah, you'd have to verify the stuff that the compiler isn't verifying, yeah. perhaps. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it is an issue, and that's why I'm looking at Elm now for the client side stuff because I think it's it's a definite improvement if you can if you can have that. I mean, 
I, I read someone saying if you if you if you insist on using dynamic layers, you're really saying that you can't be bothered to describe to the compiler this stuff, but you totally believe you can keep it all in your head. <laughs> so um, how fast have you been burdened with, uh, with that language? With closure? You just started. It's it's a bit steep. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think, Yannick? Uh, Yeah, there there is a fair there is a fair bit to learn, but so I I've I've kind of found that it's nice. It's a language that sort of reveals itself to you as you go along. Like my crash course in closure, it, it does get you a long way. You can understand a lot of it. You can you know um, another feature of the REPL which is quite nice is that you can um, you can do docs and stuff. So just stop that and do. You can look at the documentation for any closure function, or you can look at you can even look at the source if you want to perfectly easily via the REPL. And um, this is not the friendliest way to do it, but this is the basis for all of the tooling. So the fact that this stuff is available via introspection at the, at the REPL is really useful, although kind of slow. Is all your tooling um, it's Vim and the REPL? Yeah, there's a there's there's Vim plugins that make life easier, um, like uh, stuff for dealing with the S expression, so you know, making sure your brackets are all um, make sense and stuff. And um, IntelliJ as well. Yeah, there's a cursive closure, which is a much more friendly IDE style thing that does. I think that does debugging and all sorts of stuff, doesn't yeah. it? Did you look at light table? Yes, light table is kind of amazing but a bit weird for my liking. Mm. Is it, so in light table it's like an ID for closure but you, you highlight a line and you can sort of execute it. So you, uh, because it's constantly connected to a REPL which is connected to your running program, you can just sort of evaluate anything in the program. My REPL is not mm. interesting. Yeah, you can. Well, Let's use this one over here. So in it, over here um, at the REPL, I can do doc and any any function I'm interested in, and it tells me in a rather computer sciencey way <laughs> how this works. And you can do source as well, yeah, which is even more frightening. Uh, I think it's because I'm in the wrong namespace here. I don't know how to get out of it. That's why I wanted to use a different REPL, but it doesn't seem to be starting. Um, I can uh, maybe I could do one of my own. So if I did source. Closure script REPL is different from the server one. And why it doesn't like that? I don't know why my REPL's on. It's let me down, Yannick. Is that a website? Mm. That sounds so, generally speaking, you can look at the source of all the functions as well. It's quite, um, it's quite interesting looking at how terse they all are. It's all just a it is, it is, yeah, if you're that way inclined. But, um, <coughs> so that's it. Uh, I'm currently writing the Travel Public front end application test using uh, uh, using L, but I'm stuck.
this year? Um, as you said, people right. to look at this, they've got less functions. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot to it. Well, you, you've been happy enough uh, to actually do, to, as I said, do a raffle and a good plug in and then. Yeah. yeah. It's fine. It's not too bad. Uh, what else we call it?